Hello and welcome to First Flight, a Star Trek Enterprise rewatch podcast where we are watching and discussing each episode of Enterprise in succession. First Flight is a proud member of the Tricorder Transmissions Network. This is Commander Tucker of Enterprise. We've got some information you're going to want to hear. Welcome, Enterprise fans. I am your co-host, Melanie. And I'm your co-host, Abby. And tonight we are discussing Shuttle Pod 1, the 15th episode of Season 1. This episode was written by Rick Berman and Brannon Braga and directed by David Livingston. It aired on February 13th, 2002. But before we begin our discussion, we need to issue a read alert. Tactical alert. All hands to stations. There are potential spoilers ahead. We might end up talking about any part of the series at any time. We also want to give a trigger warning as the subject of suicide is discussed in this episode. And now for a summary of the episode, it's time for Abby's Captain's Log. Okay, Abby. Let's go. Captain Star Log Supplemental. All right, here we go. Shuttle Pod 1. While investigating an asteroid field, Tripp and Malcolm are convinced that Enterprise has been destroyed and that they only have 10 days of air left. All right, it's time to deploy our subspace amplifiers and get into this episode. Abby, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on Shuttle Pod 1. All right. So let's start, as always, with the cold open. So this was a really nice setup for the episode. They did a lot of exposition in a short amount of time, but they really amped up that odd couple vibe that they were going for. As soon as you saw that this was going to be Trip and Malcolm in a shuttle, and once they saw the wreckage and you realized, oh, this might be Trip and Malcolm in a shuttle for 95% of this episode, They really started playing into those personality traits that you knew were going to be at the heart of the conflict. And I really think that seeing that piece of the ship was very affecting and watching it affect Tripp and Malcolm was very affecting for us as the viewers. My only thing is, and this isn't quite just cold open, but I wish they had kept up the pretense that Enterprise was destroyed a little bit longer than coming right back from the opening credits and having it be the ship and us going, oh, it really isn't destroyed. It would have liked that to have come, I don't know, maybe a third of the way through the episode so that we kept that tension of Tripp and Malcolm coming back from when we had that break for the opening credits. Yeah, that's a really good point, Abby. I think that that would have been a great idea to keep that tension and suspense going longer and us not knowing what's going on. I hadn't thought about that. Well, we know that Enterprise isn't going to be destroyed. I mean, this is a show about Enterprise. But to have kept up the mystery of what actually happened a little longer, I think might have made it feel a little bit more intense. Yeah, I hear that. I hear that. I really like this cold open also. And I really enjoy this episode. I think it's it's really well done. When Tripp and Malcolm see that wreckage, you know, I was thinking about how intense that shock and horror must have been for them Mm -hmm. to make that realization in such a short amount of time. And then to realize that they had to focus on other things like survival. So there's really no time to think about it or to dwell on it, that everybody they know is dead, but that must've been just so horrifying for them. And so I thought that was very effective also. Yeah, you can see this, their whole body language changes when they see that wreckage and it dawns on them that this could be the ship. And the fact that they don't have any sensors at the moment, so they can't even do what they would normally do to figure out what had happened. Mm-hmm. And they feel like their their hands are tied and they're witnessing this horror and you can just see it in their bodies and you can feel that in the pit of your stomach. I mean, we've all had something, maybe not quite as dramatic as that, but something where you just realize, oh, this is real bad. And it's such a a physical, visceral reaction. And you saw that in the actors. Most definitely. So I think it was interesting to see how 
the next thing that we really see is enterprise. And we, we get this backstory. We figure out what's going on. We understand that there's something strange happening, not just to the shuttle pod, but and not just to enterprise, but to even more ships out there. And that there's definitely something in this region that is causing ships to have huge issues. And one of the things that I liked about this first scene is when you see Archer and T'Pol talking, you find out that the second in command of engineering at this point is a woman, Lieutenant Hess. And so I was really excited to hear that. And I mean, it's a minor thing, but it's one of those things that you notice, you notice that representation. And I remember noticing that when I watched this the first time around, that there there are women on this ship doing all the important jobs. And that's such a cool little thing to have thrown in, thinking that this was 20 years ago, too. Yeah, I really appreciated that also. And it stood out to me this time on my rewatch. I know later we have Kelby. Yep. He becomes the person in charge. But I liked the scene with Archer and T'Pol. It was an interesting conversation. Of course, I always love to see the little inspection pod. <laughs> <laughs> That's always fun. And what a, what a cool tool that is for them. Useful. Very useful. One thing I found interesting about T'Pol and Archer's conversation here is usually T'Pol is the skeptic mm-hmm. with time travel and science types of things. And this time, Archer is the skeptic. About the micro singularities. So I found that interesting. Yeah, it, the role reversal was interesting. And I also think it's funny that that Archer thinks is kind. this is kind of the catch-all for the Vulcans. Oh, you can't explain it? Micro singularity. And he even brings up the common cold again, which I swear this must have been cold season when the writers were writing, because this is what the third or fourth time we've heard about the common cold in the first half of season one of Enterprise. (laughs) Maybe one of the writers was just, you know, fighting a nasty sinus infection. That's funny. It is February. So let's head back to the pod. And I think it's interesting to see their reactions right away. Now, I have to say, I said with Malcolm that his initial log recording about what happened and what they saw and what they experienced and what they're noticing That is actually a really a good idea. Now, he's going to go a little overboard with all of his recordings. But this first one really is a good idea, because what if tragedy had struck Enterprise and their shuttle? And then it was years or however long until people found them. And whatever had done this had not been explained and nobody had figured it out. This could be dangerous to plenty of other ships. So that was actually a really good idea. I completely agree. It was important to be recorded. There, the facts need to be recorded for history. And I thought that was a good move for Malcolm. So let's talk again about one of my favorite things from Enterprise 2 that comes up pretty quickly. They have some seriously awesome rations on that shuttle. <laughs> like the, the choices that they have for food and anyone who's a regular listener knows I am paying attention to the food. It's another, another passion of mine. But wow, I mean, they had different ethnicities there. They had different types of proteins. They had all sorts of interesting sauces. I mean, they ended up heating up sea bass in the microwave. Now, fish in a microwave is a bad idea. And I know microwaves probably have a giant leap in technology, and maybe it's not even a microwave. But somehow, they got a ration of sea bass to be, at least as Malcolm said, delightful So that was awesome. Now, the mashed potatoes must not have been that good because they sure didn't finish them, which ended up being a good thing later on. But it just cracked me up when I heard those options of all the different meals. Yeah, I agree. I mean, they have some great rations. We've seen other Star Trek shows where they talk about how rations are not so wonderful. (laughs) And so it was nice to see them having the selection to choose from. I really liked this whole kickoff scene from the moment where they realize that Enterprise is gone and Trip says, let's take a low pass through the wreckage. And he says, see you around, Captain. Mm-hmm. From that moment into that scene to the rations that you're talking about, when they're first in panic mode, I mean, they're Starfleet officers. They're not really panicking, but they have to figure out something fast. And that's why tensions get so flared. And Trip is like, that's an order. That's an order. Make a guess as to which way to head. Where's Echo 3? Yeah. That whole part, I thought, was really, really well done. Like, I could empathize with the tension that they were feeling. 
And the other thing I really liked about this part was it shows once again, just like in Silent Enemy, that space is dangerous and Mm -hmm. hostile and scary. And as Malcolm said, huge. Space (laughs) Space is big, right? Yeah. So they are in a really bad situation. Not only did they lose everyone that they care about, but they have to figure out the survival mode, you know, in the next 20 minutes. So that part where Trip says, I left the sextant with the slide rule and all of that. Yeah. <laughs> yep. I thought that was all well crafted. Yeah. And I think it was very in character. It was mm-hmm. for both of them. And, you know, I, I do think that one of the criticisms that I always feel about this episode is that it seems like they've dialed up a couple of the personality traits on both Malcolm and Trip to a point where it's right at the edge. But then I tell myself, you know what, when you're scared, when you're anxious, when you're nervous, when you're back up against the wall, that's when your dominant personality traits really do rear their ugly heads. That's when those come out because those are your most basic and most natural instincts. So when I think about it like that, it paints a different picture for me. And I can really see what the writers were trying to do by emphasizing some of those differences in their personalities and the differences in their reactions to things. Abby, I had the same exact thought. The first time I rewatched it, I remembered from the past that I did think that some of the performances were slightly exaggerated at the beginning. But then as I watched it again, it hit me like you just said. These stakes are so high. I pictured myself in that situation, kind of freaking out. And it it felt more realistic to me. And I like that we got more characterization of these two guys. There's so much character work going on in this episode, and there's so much phenomenal acting that I know we'll talk about as it progresses that I ended up appreciating that more and more. And I also thought it was interesting when they were recording, well, when Malcolm was recording his letters, which Mm. he chose to do verbally, when he was talking to his parents I appreciated that continuity from Silent Enemy. Remember when Mm -hmm. Archer was speaking with the parents? Mm -hmm. And the way he said to them, I was surprised to hear you didn't know I was posted on Enterprise. And, you know, Aunt Sherry should have told you or whatever exactly he said. I wrote some letters. You could hear the hurt in Malcolm's voice. I'm not saying it was like passive aggressive, but that I think spoke volumes. I felt badly for Malcolm in that moment. Yeah, I feel like Malcolm has really perhaps more than any other character, even Hoshier to Paul this season, taken a bit of a journey that I I didn't expect from the beginning. Like you almost assumed that that Hoshi was going to get better at space and being in space and all that, and that to Paul was going to get better about being around humans. But I didn't expect when I watched this the first time around for Malcolm to get the layers and the depth that he did as early as Mm -hmm. he did. And for you to see that he's not just this, you know, staid guy who wants to, you know, blow everything up and who is so very stoic about things. He's got a lot more in him. And on this rewatch in particular, I have come to a very new appreciation of Malcolm. And while his letters are definitely over the top, and I, I can agree <laughs> with Trip, especially <laughs> since I know that like irrational feeling when you're trying to sleep and somebody else is keeping you up because all you want to do is sleep and they're preventing it and you get irrational. So I get that too. But I really enjoyed watching Malcolm kind of bear his soul a little bit. And it, as this episode goes on and we really get more and more of him honestly saying things, not just saying what he feels like he needs to or to wrap things up. When you really get the things that aren't going to be wrapped up in a neat, pretty bow, it's it's very nice to see Malcolm as Malcolm. I agree. That's one of my favorite parts of this episode. And as the episode progresses, as we will talk about, we see more and more of that. Well, Abby, we've come to the part of the episode where I think we have to discuss Malcolm's dream. What are your thoughts? Oh, big heaving sigh right here. This <laughs> This is not my favorite scene. It's kind of icky and Mm -hmm. nauseating. Like I I get it. It's a dream and it's exaggerated and no one can be held responsible for their dreams. But you know, the writers wrote this dream. So 
I do find it very interesting that in his dream, T'Pol is all impressed with his heroics and Archer is all impressed with his heroics and Flox is just Flox. Like, he's not impressed. He's just being <laughs> a doctor. He's matter of fact. It's just uncomfortable. And having rewatched it multiple times in a row for us to talk about it, it doesn't get less uncomfortable. And I don't mm-hmm. find a ton of redeeming value from it besides the fact that it makes a nice tie-in to the end scene of the episode right and i get that this was probably shoehorned in because they were on upn the network at the time they upn was trying to prove that star trek its big selling point could also draw other viewers of a certain demographic they had a lot more say in putting more of this gratuitous content on than what Mm -hmm. the writers and directors would have wanted. And they've said that many times over since the show has wrapped. And I get that. And I still wish it wasn't in this episode. How about you? Yeah, I hear you. Okay, there's nothing wrong with people finding people attractive or having dreams or daydreams or whatever. That's cool. And if people ship these two or just happen to like this scene, great. That being said, it just doesn't work for me either. Maybe it's because it's so out of the blue or because we are very sensitive to the frequent objectification of T'Pol. So I'm on the same page as you. This is reminiscent of how I felt about that scene in Shadows of Pajem. It goes on too long. It does feel gratuitous to me. It doesn't feel necessary to the episode. I watched it twice. And the second time, it was just as drawn out as the first, as you said. So I actually ended up muting it the (laughs) second time. And later in my research, I learned that there was another scene shot for this episode where Tripp and Malcolm were having a conversation about more backstory of the friendship with Tripp and Archer. Mm. And I would much have preferred the time be used for that. That would have been more interesting to me. So to me, this is a decon as we call it, of the episode. For me, I still love this episode and I think it's great. I could go without that scene, no problem. (laughs) So I'm on the same page as you. Well, and I think that's a really interesting thing to note that we both feel like this could be just taken out because there are so many directorial and editing and production decisions that are so good in this episode that you almost want to just think about that as a hiccup. Because I mean, when you look at all the different tight, strange angle shots that really make you feel like you're trapped in the shuttle pod with them. The frost that slowly starts to go over everything in the cabin as they lower the temperature. All of those little details are really amazing. How they they actually look cold. It feels cold. Very, very interesting things going on here, production design line. Now, I don't know that that makes up for the fact that we have that shoehorned in, but very nice editing and directorial choices from the other parts. Oh, for sure. I know I'm jumping ahead here and we can, we can get back to the middle of the episode, but I have to say, having rewatched this again and remembering this from the past, that when they are shivering, and there's a lot of that, the acting is so amazing like if you watch all the little nuances of Malcolm's hand shaking the bottle Mm -hmm. as he's talking and the way they're talking their facial like it made me wonder did they put them in a sub-zero room because the acting is beyond great for me this feels like a a stage play like you could substitute people to do this play I mean they wouldn't be as good as these two guys but you know what I mean it's just It's that good. I I see what you mean about the tight shots and the makeup and the frost, especially as you get to the end of the episode. Mm -hmm. I was really blown away by the acting. So, yeah. And I think that the scene is lessened slightly by right after that scene. And when, you know, Tripp wakes him up and asks who Stinky is, you do get that Archer and T'Pol ready room chat scene where you get to see the real T'Pol. And I think that that's a nice counterpoint where you can really see mm-hmm. the difference between the uh, in Malcolm's brain to Paul and the actual to Paul. I hadn't thought about that. 
That is a good segue. I like that. That makes sense. Well, and that chat is so interesting as well, because I think at this point, they know each other pretty well, Archer and T'Pol. They've been through some stuff. They they know that T'Pol is keeping the safety of the crew and, and cares about them in her Vulcan way. So when she has to actually come out and say and state it flat out, I was never implying that scientific research or discovery was more important than our crewmates. It felt to me almost like it was, I wanted to say, aren't we past this yet? You shouldn't have to say this. Archer does know this. But I think he wanted her to have to say it because it was one of those things where it it was that power struggle back and forth. And a lot of times she tells him stuff that really puts him in his place and opens his eyes. And I think this time he was doing it a little bit back to her. Yeah, that was super interesting. I really like that she said it because I think in the past she wouldn't have said it. Right. Mm -hmm. And now that she's more part of the family, like we talked about last time, she and this is not very Vulcan of her, but she wanted Archer to know, hey, I have a conscience. I care about these people. So the fact that she took the time to say it, I kind of liked No, it totally makes sense. And I think it was very deliberate that the writers made her say it out loud. So there was not a question at all in there. There was none of those, well, you Vulcans, this or that. No, she flat out said it. And he wanted her to say it so that it was out there in the open. There was nothing implied about this. It was there. That was a good scene. It's a beautiful scene. And again, the segues are beautiful in this episode because then that goes back to where We're back in the shuttle with Malcolm and Tripp, and we get that whole scene that by the end of it all, Malcolm is admitting that Enterprise really is his real family, that Mm -hmm. this is where his his heart is for so many reasons. And watching that ship blow up, this is the first time that he's really admitting that almost everybody he cared about was on that ship. And all those other people he was writing letters to were loose ends, but they weren't Mm -hmm. what was really bothering him. And this is... You know, this is, again, when you're talking about they're living through a trauma right now. They're having this experience. And things take a while. When you have a shock like that, there are, you know, chemicals that are released into your body where you don't, you don't process it all the way. So this and, you know, the bourbon are helping that process to kind of come into, into focus for him. And that was really a beautiful moment. I agree. That was heartbreaking and beautiful. And since you mentioned trauma, I do think one of the things that amps up the trauma in this episode is the highs and the lows. Mm -hmm. Because one thing I thought about upon rewatching it was when they hear Hoshi's voice and realize that everything's okay and they have that split second moment of absolute joy followed by the split second moment of, oh, damn, it's too late. Exactly. That up and down, high and low is really intense emotionally. And I, and I felt for them in that moment. And I thought they played that well. Yeah, I can com- completely in sync with that one. That is beautifully done and well said about the highs and the lows. I hadn't thought about it like that, but you're right. It's almost like getting punched in the gut multiple times. Yeah. At the end here, Abby, I thought it was pretty clever that they thought about blowing up the impulse engine. That was clever. Very. And and Malcolm finally convinced Tripp as to why that was absolutely necessary. And once again, I can't help but think of a TOS callback. It made me think about the original series episode, the Galileo 7, which is one of my all-time favorites, where at the end, Spock jettisons the fuel and ignites it to send out a a flare, as they put it, basically a a one-in-a-million shot (laughs) to be seen, just like here. And it completely reminded me of that. So I appreciated that. Yeah, you're in sync with me again, because Um, I hadn't thought of that, but my own TOS callback, since we've just put our little fun soundbite in, is I noticed the makeup in this episode was of TOS level intensity. Like, especially for me, it was Malcolm's lipstick, which was extra pink this time, even when he (laughs) was freezing. And that made me think a lot about the close-up shots that we got in TOS of 
them and how they had so much more makeup, especially when Spock had his eyeshadow going on. And you would notice it in those those close ups that we got so many of in this scene. So even though I'm sure that wasn't deliberate, I I enjoyed making that connection. Now that you mention it, Abby, I can totally picture that the the lipstick and Mm -hmm. perhaps the mascara that I (laughs) thought I saw. It was pretty intensified here. And that is so Spock like. I love it. So since we're giggling, let's go to the scene where they're giggling and uh, they have had quite a bit of the bourbon and are feeling quite loose and, and giggly themselves. I love this scene with the exception of to Paul's bum. Ugh. Let's just put that aside for a second. First of all, I forgot to mention, I love these enterprise jackets Yes, and I want one. Yes. I want one of those zip up, Enterprise jackets, whether they're the quilted ones from Broken Bow mm-hmm. that they discarded or these ones, I want one. Okay. Yep. I liked the acting here, I w- especially when I watched it the second time when I-, I thought both of their acting was so good. Again, the shivering, the, the talking, the expressions, it-, it just worked for me. And I love the line that Tripp says the galaxy's not getting any of our bourbon. (laughs) Yep. I love that line. We've all been at parties with somebody like that. (laughs) I just thought that was so cute. (laughs) Cute and clever. And I think this is where that deleted part happened, where Tripp told a story about Archer, which, Mm. again, I I think they might have wove part of it into another episode about scuba diving or training or something like that. But this leads us into the trip wanting to sacrifice himself into the airlock. And I I think we should talk about that. What are your thoughts on that part? Well, first of all, I think it is very much in character. I think, Mm -hmm. but while I have had some criticism of how they have gotten to this point of the episode, I really think this point of the episode and, and this scene is very powerful. I mean, once they both start realizing what the other is thinking and how de- deadly serious both of them are, it's mm-hmm. so intense in such a heartwarming way because they are both trying to do what they think is best for the other one and they don't agree. And it's very dramatic and very intense. And I I like that in the end, Trip gives in and, you know, he could have he could have ordered him. He could have made him shoot him. And I really think he probably would have, mm-hmm. but uh, I, I really enjoyed this. This was, was kind of the moment where they locked eyes and it was head to head. And they realized that they both just wanted both of them to survive. And if they couldn't, then they were just, they were a team at this point one way or another. Yeah. I agree. It was so powerful and poignant at the same time. And and a milestone, I think, in the development of their friendship, because before yes. this episode, they are hanging out, but they're not really friends yet. Right. And when Malcolm says to him, I'm your armory officer and possibly your friend, yes. that really got me. And I do think them deciding to die together I mean, you said it so well, I can't really add to it. It just was super powerful and a really great part of the episode. I got misty-eyed a few times in this episode, and and that was probably one of them. I think three different times I got a little (laughs) misty-eyed. I can't help it. But that was really, really well done. This is the place I think that it's the turning point from their co-workers who are also friends to they are friends who are also co-workers. And while it seems like a minor change, it's a big distinction. And I mm-hmm. think that Archer and Trip were friends that were also co-workers before this, but Malcolm and Trip were not. And after this, they are. And, and in the future episodes, and as we discuss this going further on in the seasons, I think you see that change. And I don't think either one of them ever forgets that they went through this, even if it's not explicitly mentioned there's a difference in their their relationship and their understanding of each other that we see play out in the future. 
Yes, I agree. And in the sick bay scene at the end, when Malcolm turns to Trip and says, Trip, can I call you Trip? Hmm. That was also really poignant. And when he says, Sleep well, my friend, that does show that they had this bonding experience and they are more friends now. And they learned a lot about each other yeah. in the episode. So I liked that tie up at the end there. Yeah, I think that the tie up was really nice. And I think that. The small callbacks to and parallels with Malcolm's dream were the only reason that that dream should be in there, because then you realize mm-hmm. that this was real. It wasn't somebody's, you know, hypothermia dream, which I appreciate. And I also appreciate that Flox is still not impressed. <laughs> it just <laughs> made me laugh. But this kind of leads me to the last thing I wanted for us to discuss here that there was always this rumor out there that in the very last shot of the scene where you see the two men, Malcolm and Tripp, in the the sickbay beds, and then you see the written by Rick Berman and Brandon Bragas, and their names each are on top of one guy. And they were like, oh, well, when you look at this, you realize that each one of those writers was one of these guys. They were like stand-ins for them and their relationship. And if you want to look at more on that there is plenty on the internet just type that into your favorite search engine and you will find a large rabbit hole to fall down but it made me think who am i more like malcolm or trip and Mm. so i'll answer because i've had time to think about this and then i'll pop it over to you so i like to think that i have a lot of trip in me that i'm i'm warm and i'm friendly and i'm competent and professional but also have a good sense of humor and that I follow my instincts. But I really have to say that when it all kind of comes down to it, I think I might really be more like Malcolm. I definitely like things just so. I definitely follow the rules even when I'm in a bad situation. I definitely would have recorded that first log. Now, I'm not sure I would have recorded so many more letters or like you point out, done them all out loud when I could have just typed them in and edited better. (laughs) But I get that that was, you know, for dramatic effect. I really think that when it comes down to it, I might have been I might have been more like Malcolm throughout all of it. And that surprised me when I came to that realization, because like I said, I have never I've never really had strong feelings about Malcolm until this rewatch through and talking with you. And now I find that more and more he is resonating with me. And this has been an eye opener for me that I really have a great deal of Malcolm in me. And that's not Mm. something that I'm upset about. So how about you, Melanie? Who are you in this situation more, Malcolm or Tripp? That's a really good and interesting question, Abby. I think if I were in this exact situation on the shuttle pod, I would most definitely be more like Malcolm. <laughs> I would I would want to keep hope alive and as a Starfleet officer, try to, to look on the bright side, right? Mm-hmm. And if I were the commanding officer, I would probably want to keep up morale. However, when I really think about the vastness of space and what they were dealing with, in retrospect, I think Malcolm was more of the realist in this situation. And I know my personality and I would also be pretty freaked out <laughs> and, you know, accepting death. And I would, I would want to say goodbyes to people. I would want to record the official log, which... I think was important, but I would want to reach out to people. I would want to do those letters. And I think when push comes to shove, I probably would have responded in a manner very similar to Malcolm. I would try to have elements of trip. I would really try. But ultimately, I think my nature would have been more like Malcolm, if that makes sense. It makes total sense. So that leaves me wondering, all you listeners out there, are you more of a Malcolm or a trip or, you know, a Malcolm with a a sauce of trip or a shade of Malcolm on trip? What are you? We'd love to hear this in the discussion. So you come and find us and let us know how you think you would have reacted in this situation. Well, that brings us to our Porthos's pick, which is our favorite part of the episode. Abby, what's your favorite part? Well, I've got just kind of a small one here. And even though Hoshi was not a huge part of this episode, I loved when Malcolm and Tripp 
both owned up to the fact that she has saved their butts a couple of times. And they were both talking about how they can't wait to tell that to her parents. Of course, they were debating when that would happen and if they would still be there to hear the reaction. But I love that Hoshi got the call out she deserved from these two men who have both seen her in action. Oh, that's a good one. I took a note on this also. At the beginning, you kind of get the feeling that they haven't been with the Tesnians that long. Mm -hmm. And when Archer says to Hoshi, did you learn their language? And she just matter of factly says, yes, sir. Yep, (laughs) exactly. It blew my mind when I really thought about it that she probably learned their language like in a day or yeah. two. <laughs> yeah. And how, how does a person do that? So that stood out to me as well, just the way she was so matter of fact. Yep, learn their language. So I'm with you on this one. So what about you? What was your favorite part of the episode? Well, I have a tiny little backup Porthos pick first, which is when Malcolm says to Trip, I'm pretty sure that You use up a lot of oxygen when you shout like that. I, for some reason, I just love that line and I love the way he delivered it. I do too. My favorite part is it's a line and a sequence. When Trip says, when Trip makes the toast to the brave men and women of the Starship Enterprise, Mm -hmm. that was so important and so Trip that. They did take that moment to do that because, as I mentioned, everything's happening so fast, they can't really grieve, right? Right. But when he makes that toast, it just gets to me. And then that leads into the sequence of Malcolm talking about his comfort level, like you mentioned before, that he breaks down and says, these are the people I care about. And I was just starting to get close to them. And the only person left thinks I'm the bloody Grim Reaper. (sighs) And that leads into Trip blowing out the candle and saying, you know, an extra six minutes sounds a a whole lot better right now. That sequence got me not only because it's so good, but it it kind of shifted the tone. It, it brought the tone down to real serious. I mean, it already was serious, but you know what I mean? I just really loved that sequence from the toast to the candle. I thought was beautiful. And that was my favorite part. Yeah, I agree with you. That is absolutely a beautiful sequence. And it's so raw. And I think that's, that's it really strikes me is that it almost feels like you shouldn't be watching it because they're both just so hard on their sleeve and honest mm-hmm. at that moment. And they're both acknowledging without saying anything that they know how honest the other one is being and that they have had a moment and it does change everything for the rest of that episode. And I think for their entire relationship. So Beautiful pick. Accessing library computer data. Well, now it's time for the sharing of some trivia. Abby, what can you tell us about Shuttle Pod 1? Well, I think this is interesting because out of all of the episodes of Star Trek thus far, and we just finished the first five of Prodigy, and for some people, the very beginning of season four of Discovery. But up until this point, this is the only episode of Star Trek that includes no guest stars or background performers. And it has no background cast, no stunt performers, nothing. Only the seven main actors. And actually, it's really only six because you only hear Travis over the comm. And I just thought that, wow, what a wonderful way to do a bottle show. I mean, they must have saved heaps of money on sets and casting on this one, but it didn't show in the quality of the story. Yeah, for a planned bottle show to save money, they ended up with something pretty exquisite and probably better than they expected. So very well done bottle show. And that kind of segues into my piece of trivia, which is similar, that this is one of the very few Star Trek episodes that does not feature a scene on the bridge at all. There's no bridge scene. And I thought that was interesting. Yeah, and I love the fact that both of our trivia tonight is about the absence of something as opposed to Mm -hmm. something added in. So very interesting parallels here. Transfer of data is complete. Well, we've arrived at our Vulcan's verdict. On a scale of 1 to 10 grapplers, how do you rate this episode? 
All right. So I like that we really get some time to explore the relationship between these two characters. And as I said, by the end, I really like where they had gotten between them. However, if you'll indulge me, I felt like it was a long road getting from there to here. And for me, this episode just never quite lived up to all the hype that it gets. So I find it good. It's solid, but it's not just amazing for me. So I give it seven out of 10 grapplers. How about you, Melanie? Okay. I totally understand and respect how you feel that way. I think for me, despite the concerns that we talked about, because it's such a strong and powerful character study, and the acting is so wonderful, and it did make me misty-eyed several times, I ended up giving it a 9 out of 10 grapplers. Nice. My chronometer is running backwards, sir. Incoming transmission. You read my letter? Well, we know what that means. It's time for Daniels to send us back in the timeline to hear some of your thoughts and your picks. Abby, what do you have for us tonight? So for today, we have something special. We normally get most of our feedback from Twitter, and we love seeing you there, and we love chatting with you there. But we also have an Instagram, First Flight Pod on Instagram, and we got a great piece of feedback about our Silent Enemy episode from Evatronic. And uh, she commented, I completely agree with your review of this episode. The bringing together of Hoshi to Paul and Malcolm created an interesting dynamic, and it's a shame it wasn't developed further in future episodes. The final scene in Decontamination really was a special moment, and it's a clear winner for Porthos pick for me, too. And then she goes on to say, there's so much to each episode, and I particularly love the frontier tone that we have in Enterprise compared with the established utopia of the older series. And you know what? I couldn't agree more. And I love that you are finding what we're saying interesting and relevant and that you love Enterprise as much as we do. So please come and find us on Instagram or Twitter or anywhere else that you can interact with us. We love hearing your comments. Yes, I really appreciated her comments also and what she said about that frontier tone. And she also mentioned that for her, Enterprise feels more similar to Deep Space Nine in its storytelling and character development, which I thought was a really interesting point. Thank you, Eve. And if you would like to continue the discussion with us or share any of your thoughts or picks, we can be reached at First Flight Pod on Twitter and Instagram. And our podcast can be found on the following platforms. On Apple, Google, and Spotify, on the First Flight feed, or under Tricorder Transmissions, or on YouTube under the Tricorder Transmissions channel. And if anyone would like to write us a review on Apple Podcasts and has the time to do so, we would greatly appreciate it. Thank you. Abby, what's the best way to reach you? Best way to get me is on Twitter, and that's Abby M. Summer, S-O-M-M-E-R. We want to thank you for spending this time with us, and we'll be back next time with Fusion, the 16th episode of Season 1. And as always, we leave you with this quote from Captain Jonathan Archer. The most profound discoveries are not necessarily beyond that next star. They're within us, woven into the threads that bind us, all of us, to each other. <laughs>